Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Bio2. By now, I hope you've already had a chance to talk to me in lab about basic policies, syllabus, concepts, etc. So I'm going to jump directly into chapter one. I do want to let you know the book uh, is listed in the syllabus, so you'll want to use that. But many of my uh, lectures don't go directly from the text. They use some from the text and some from other textbooks I've used in the past. So be sure to use the PowerPoints that I present to fill in your notes and use those notes to study for the exam. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with chapter one here. So get out your lecture notes and fill them in as we go. Remember, you can pause and resume, back up, et cetera, so you can get everything you need. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here, chapter one overview, and here we go. Okay, uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is nutrient and energy cycling. So when we talk about ecosystems, which is where living things live, including us, the dynamics of these ecosystems depend on two processes. The first is called the cycling of nutrients. That is molecules, atoms, et cetera, cycle between the different components. That is, they stay here, but go from place to place. Organic and inorganic molecules like food, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, they go between different components. They don't arrive on earth or leave earth, they cycle. Now this is very different to the flow of energy. Now, unlike nutrients, atoms, molecules, etc., energy comes in to our planet as sunlight and leaves as heat energy. So it's a one-way flow, always from the sun, through our system, and out as heat. Okay, the cell is the lowest level of structure that can perform all activities required for life. Now, in case you didn't catch, chapter one is an overview for the whole text, basically everything that we'll be talking about for the semester. And one of the first main things we'll be talking about after we talk about atoms and molecules is cells. So the cell is the lowest level of structure that can perform all activities required for life. So if something is simpler than a cell, for example, a virus is not considered alive. All organisms are composed of cells. So from bacteria up to us, we're considered organisms. Viruses are not considered organisms, they're considered particles. Even though they do things that can be disruptive and seem lifelike, they're not considered alive by biologists. They're very small and they require a microscope to see. And there are a few cells that can be seen with the naked eye, but they're the small minority. Most of them do require a microscope and we will be looking through a microscope in lab to see those. Cells make up organs and tissues. So for example, tissues such as muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and organs like the heart are made up of cells. We can distinguish two major types of cells. So when I ask, what are the two major types of cells? The first is called prokaryotic, which are very simple, and the other are called eukaryotic, which are more complex. So we are eukaryotes, bacteria are prokaryotes, and we'll be talking more about these here in just a moment. Okay, so talking about prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells, let's take a look at this image. You can see it's animating in here. The prokaryotic cell is simple and contains no organelles. So here is a prokaryotic cell. This is a bacterium. Now note, it's much smaller than that large eukaryotic cell in the background. It does contain DNA because all living things do. It has a cell wall. They can often have structures sticking out like flagella, but the key is they're much smaller, they're much simpler, and they don't have organelles. So please make a note of that. Most common example is bacteria. Now there are other non-bacteria prokaryotes, but most prokaryotes are bacteria. The eukaryotic cell is more complex and contains the organelles and is almost always larger. So you can see the eukaryotic cell in the background with organelles. This is a mitochondria, lysosomes, a nucleus, etc. So both types of cells have DNA, but the eukaryotic cell keeps its DNA inside of a nucleus. Plants and animals are good examples of eukaryotes, although they are not the only ones. There'll be other eukaryotes that we'll be talking about later. The nucleus is the largest organelle in most eukaryotic cells. So if you're looking at an organelle and you can only see one and it's fairly large and spherical, that would be the nucleus. DNA and genes, I'm sure you've heard about this. All cells use DNA as the chemical material of genes. Now, not all viruses do. That's why they're not cells. And that's why they're not alive. But all living cells use DNA as the chemical material of genes, which carry the traits that make us us. Genes are the units of inheritance that transmit information from parents to offspring, all the way from bacteria up to humans. 
the language of DNA contains just four letters, and you can see them here. A stands for adenine, G for guanine, C for cytosine, and T for thymine. Now, all of our DNA is made up of just these four letters. It seems like it's not complex enough to account for all of the complexity in our bodies, but it is. It just turns out that the words that write the information that build us are very, very long words compared to English. Words that use 26 letters can be much shorter with much more variation. Okay, we're also gonna be talking about genetic engineering later in the semester. Genetic engineering and biotechnology have allowed us to manipulate the DNA and genes of organisms. So we're gonna be talking about how DNA has been manipulated and changed, modified to help human beings. This has led to controversies about the safety of genetically engineered plants and animals. We will be talking about the controversies, whether or not people feel safe uh, interacting with these, consuming these as food or having them around them. What are some examples? Cloned sheep, uh, we'll be talking about cloned sheep and genetically modified foods. Most of what we eat in terms of corn and soy have been genetically modified unless it says GMO free. We'll be talking that more, more about that later when we get to the chapter on gen genetic modification and genetic engineering. Life in its diverse forms. Now we're gonna be talking about what accounts for how many different kinds of organisms that we see on the planet. So this statement, diversity is the hallmark of a successful ecosystem. What does that mean? Well, diversity means how many different kinds of things you see. And hallmark means a key indicator. So how many different things is a key indicator of a successful ecosystem? For example, a rainforest has lots and lots of different kinds of organisms, very successful. But a downtown urban area has much fewer, for example, pigeons or you know, sparrows. There's a few living things there, people, but not as successful as a rainforest. So the diversity of known life includes 1.7 million species. It's up to somewhere like 1.8, 1.8 and a half, but we're not going to worry as much about the specific numbers. It's approximately that. Estimates of the total diversity range, if we could find every living thing on the planet, is from 5 million to over 30 million species. Now, I want to make you aware of something. One of the review questions says, have we already found most of the living things that we expect to find? Now, you have to use the term most. What is most? Well, it certainly means more than half, more like three quarters or more. Now, if you look at 1.7 and you compare it to 5 to 30, that's definitely not even half. Half of five would be 2.5, and most of five would be four. 1.7 is not most of five or even 30. So the answer to that question, have we found most of the expected species on the planet? The answer is false. Okay, so make a note of that in your review questions. Okay, grouping up species. Now, how do we organize living things when we find a new one? Where do we put it in the big family tree of life? Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this, the family tree of life has every living thing in it from the simplest up to the most complex. Now, later on, I'm going to argue that the most highly evolved organisms are birds and not humans, but that's a somewhat unpopular uh, point, and I'll explain why I say that later on. But biodiversity is like diversity, but bio refers to life, so the number of different living things in an area. Taxonomy is the branch of biology that names and classifies species. This is what I did my master's thesis on. That is, where do you put living things on this tree of life? Is it always based on their color or size? Well, it turns out it's based on lots of different things. What it does is it formalizes the hierarchical ordering of organisms. Now, what does that mean? Formalizes means makes it a formal way of doing it rather than randomly or by someone's uh, whim. The hierarchical ordering of organisms, what do we mean by that? Hierarchical, going from a larger group. For example, animals is a very large group that includes lots of living things. As a matter of fact, these butterflies are mammals. Excuse me, are animals. <laughs> My mistake. Most people tend to think of animals as being mammals, furry things, but it's not the case. So when you take animals, it includes lots of different kinds of living things. Fish, birds, mammals insects, worms, believe it or not, are even animals. And then when you divide that up into smaller groups, for example, these are all insects in here, which is a smaller division. And then within that, you would have butterflies. And within that, you would have individual species. So what these drawers are showing is that 
within the drawer, there can be some variation, but all of the butterflies in one drawer have more in common with each other than all the butterflies over here. As a matter of fact, I wanna say these are moths, these are butterflies. Now notice all the butterflies in here do not look exactly the same, but they have more in common with each other than they do with anything in the other drawers, even though they don't look color-wise exactly the same. They have more things in common with each other than they do over here. And even though these look very different from each other, they have more in common with each other than they do with the other drawers. So what does that mean? Exactly what I said. Putting things on the big family tree of life in a way that is based on science and criteria that are logical rather than just based on a whim. What do these butterflies have to do with taxonomy? Well, when they find a new butterfly, they have to decide any living thing, they have to decide which drawer it goes into. Now, they're not going to use just the color or the size to determine it. They use lots of different things. For example, the genes or the body shape or some of the key internal characteristics, not just size and color. That is something that a little kid would say, well, this is yellow, so it goes in the yellow drawer. But as we get older and more understanding of how things are similar and different, just because it seems similar on the outside doesn't make it similar on the inside and vice versa for differences, okay? So this is what we're talking about when we talk about grouping species together. Okay, what are the three domains of life? When I was in high school, there were only kingdoms. You can see the kingdoms here. But now they have domains, which groups things even to even larger groups. So we have domain eukarya, which are eukaryotes, and we have domain bacteria and domain archaea. So bacteria, and archaea, these top two, are the prokaryotes that I talked about earlier. Simple, no organelles, small. And then eukarya is a domain that contains four separate kingdoms. You can see protista. We're going to be talking about protists. What are they? Generally small. Plantae, plants. You guys know what plants are, but I'll be explaining a little bit more about what is a plant, what is not later. Fungi, fungus, and then animals, which is us. Believe it or not, we are animals. Yes, we are people, but we're also grouped into the kingdom animalia based on our shared characteristics with other, other mammals and other animals. Okay, so let's talk about bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotic domains. Now, what does that mean? It means the cells are small, simple, no organelles. Domain eukarya includes at least four kingdoms, protista, plantae, fungi, and animals. Animalia. Okay, underlying the diversity of life is a striking unity, especially at the lower levels of structure. So what does that mean? It means the, that even though things that seem very different on the outside, on the surface, when you look deeper are more similar. For example, us and worms seem very, very different when you look on the outside, right? We're big, we're us, worms are much smaller and simpler, but if you look inside at the individual cells, you'll see a lot of similarity. As a matter of fact, even though we seem very, very different than bacteria, we have some similarities to them at the lowest levels, at the simplest levels, such as molecules and DNA, the universal genetic language of DNA. So even though we're very different than many other kinds of organisms, we all have DNA and it's all written the same way. So one explanation for how it is that we have so many different things with so many similarities at the simplest level is evolution. Now, evolution is a controversial notion, even in this modern day and age, uh, but we will be introducing the idea of evolution here in chapter one, and we'll be going into much more detail into how evolution is thought to have worked uh, later on in later chapters. Alternative in view, uh, views include intelligent design. Now, we're going to be talking about why intelligent design is not a scientific uh, hypothesis uh, la uh, later on here in this lecture. Okay, so evolution is biology's unifying thing. Most biologists believe that evolution is what has led to the differences that we see. Now, when you hear the word evolution, most people think of, oh, people used to be monkeys, and that's not what evolution means. It just means change over time. Now, most people who are rational would understand that things are different now than they used to be. And if things have changed over time, then that means they've evolved. So evolution just means change over time. So please note, when I ask about that, I'm not saying humans evolved from ape-like ancestors. I'm saying things change over time. 
As a matter of fact, we're not going to go into human origins because they're still very controversial, but we will be talking about how populations change over time in measurable, uh, easy to understand ways that are absolutely beyond scientific question. Okay, fossils that have been found in the soil support Darwin's assertions. Now, who do we mean by Darwin? He is the person who originally proposed the idea of evolution through natural selection. He wrote a book. We'll be talking more about that later. But fossils that have been dug up, DNA that has been analyzed, all support what Darwin's assertions were about how this works. One of his assertions was that similar species share a common ancestor that ties all the members of the group together. That is, all of the diverse descendants from the ancestor have something in common with that common ancestor. So for example, bears have many similarities to each other, but also share similarities with other mammals because bears and all mammals have a common ancestor from which they diverged many, many millions of years ago. Darwin published the book, The Origin of Species in 1859 and is still after all this time, considered one of the most controversial books ever written in science and in biology for, uh, for sure. Uh, part of the reason is because it, it tends to butt heads with uh, religious points of view, uh, um, non-science uh, points of view about the origin of life. The book contained two main points. What is the first? It's called descent with modification. What does that mean? It means a change in form from an ancestor in the past to the modern species today. So if you look at if you look at uh, a fossil, you find that they are different from the past. If you dig down deeper, they're different in the past than they are now which means that organisms were different in the past than they are now. And that's called descent with modification. Your descendants, your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are gonna be slightly different than we are. Modification means change, changing over time. The second main point is called natural selection. We're gonna be talking about this in detail. The environment is what dictates which characteristics are beneficial, and which are detrimental and molds organisms accordingly. Now, what do we mean? The environment in which an organism lives determine whether the genes that it is born with are gonna be good, in quotes, or not good, in quotes. And that's only based on whether or not those genes work for the current local environment. We're gonna go into detail on that later. So what were Darwin's conclusions? Darwin's concept of natural selection is based on two uncontroversial facts. What do we mean by uncontroversial? It means anybody could observe this and most people wouldn't argue over these facts. It was the conclusions that are, that are uh, controversial, not the facts that, on which they're based. The first one is called overproduction and struggle for existence. What do we mean? More offspring will be produced or be born than can survive. This is true for almost all animals, even humans, except in America, most of our offspring survive. But for most animals, more babies are born than can live, and this leads for a struggle for existence. Now, which ones are going to be successful? Which ones are going to live? It's the ones that have the best genes. Now, we used to say the strongest. Well, the strongest makes sense, but only in the simplest way. We don't literally mean the ones that have the biggest muscles. Being the strongest or most fit could sometimes mean small and quick or camouflage or big and strong. It just depends on what works for that organism. So this is the uncontroversial this is the uncontroversial first fact. Second, individual variation. Individuals in the same species are different from each other. If you look at an individual, for example, humans, look at how many different kinds of humans there are, different colors, shapes, hair, hair types, etc. But we're all the same species. And the way that we know that we're the same species is because we choose to mate with each other across those differences. But there's a lot of variations within all species. So when you put these together, Darwin's conclusion was natural selection. And that is, if there's going to be more than can survive, and there's a lot of differences between them, the ones that have the best genes for their current local environment will have more offspring than the ones who don't. Now, please note, it doesn't necessarily mean the ones that are poorly adapted are going to die. They can survive. And as a matter of fact, they can reproduce. It just turns out the ones that have the better genes will have more offspring than the ones have the less beneficial genes. And that means those good genes will be passed on more than the less good genes. Uh, and over time, many generations, you'll see the better genes propagate 
and become more common, and the less beneficial genes will eventually become extinct over time. Okay, so let's take a look at how natural selection works. Now, for example, if we look at these beetles here, there's a big variety of color. Well, it turns out if you put this, this group of beetles, which for the sake of argument is one species, the same way there's lots of colors of people, you put them on a dark background, you'll see that not all of the beetles are well suited for the environment. Some of them stick out like a sore thumb and some blend in pretty well. So let's get through the notes. In any population, there's a variation between members, in this case, color. Now notice that there's different colors of beetles. Some blend in better than others. Certain traits will be less successful at survival and reproduction. Birds eat those that do not blend in the background. So what's gonna happen is when the bird comes by, they're gonna see the white ones and eat them first and the dark ones will blend in and not be eaten. So what does that mean? In this case, a good gene would be to be dark in color and a bad gene would be light in color. Now, the only reason why it's bad is because the environment that they happen to find themselves on is dark. If they happen to find themselves on a light environment, a light background, the opposite would be true. Now, the gene doesn't change. It's whether or not it suits the environment is whether or not what makes it good. The survivors that pest possess the best traits for that environment reproduce more. In this case, the dark ones would reproduce more. And notice over time, the population changes because the genes for dark color are going to be successful and be passed down. The genes for light color would be lost due to predation. And so this population here at the end is different than the population at the beginning. What made that different? The environment. The environment was not beneficial to these light colored beetles, so they did not make it. They did not have as many offspring because you can't have offspring when you've been eaten by a bird. All right, let's talk about a couple more concepts. Artificial versus natural selection. Artificial selection is that that favors traits that are appealing to humans and not necessarily those that would suit the organism best in the wild. What do we mean by artificial selection? Well, it means that people specifically pick individual organisms to mate with each other because we like something about them. <clears throat> For example, this Dalmatian had a really cool coat. So instead of just letting this, the dog, first dog that have this reproduced with whatever, they reproduced it with other dogs that looked like that so that they could have a separate breed of dog called the Dalmatian. That was humans specifically picking individual dogs to mate with each other so that they could isolate this characteristic. And the same with the St. Bernard and the same with the Basset Hound. All of these things were selected by people to maintain those unique characteristics. And that's what artificial selection means. How have these miniature horses become so small? Well, what they did was they took the smallest horse they could find and mated it with another small horse. And then the next generation of all the baby horses born, they took the smallest of those and mated it with other very small horses. And they kept doing that over and over and over again. And now you have horses even smaller than this, as big as cats or small dogs, because you keep pushing by picking the smallest horse to mate with another small horse. This is why it's called artificial selection, because humans pick instead of the environment picking. Now, in most cases, the environment would not support these tiny horses or very unique looking dogs, because these dogs work in the environment of human society, not out in the, in the wild. What is the nearest common relative of all these dogs? Well, it turns out it's the wolf. The wolves were domesticated and turned into these different breeds by humans by selecting the different um, breeds that we happen to like. So wolves are the nearest common relative of all dogs. And you can see the wolf-like characteristics in this husky. It's the one that has been modified the least away from its ancestor, the wolf. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how science works. There are two forms of science. One is called discovery and the other is called hypothesis. -driven. The first is discovery science, and that is finding new facts. Now, you might think that this is really important, and it is to a certain extent. Finding new things, discovering new planets, discovering new organisms. Hypothesis-driven science is putting facts together to come up with new explanations or theories. Now, it turns out the most famous and influential scientists of all time were in the second category, hypothesis-driven science. Now, if you think in your mind of scientists you might have heard of, uh, Newton, Galileo, Darwin, um, who else? People like that, Madame Curie. They all became famous based on hypothesis-driven science. 
Now, there are some scientists who became famous for to discovery science. For example, for example, Edmund Halley. Halley discovered Halley's Comet or Halley's Comet and became famous for that. Most of the famous scientists are famous because they come up with new theories about observed uh, facts. So what is discovery science? Science seeks natural causes for natural events. So we look into the environment to see why things happen. One of the key things is we have to make observations and observations are something you notice with your senses. What are some examples? Darwin collected plant and animal species throughout South America. That was observations. He made observations before he made his conclusions. You can look out into the natural world with your eyes, your ears, your sense of smell or taste. You can observe uh, devices that are measuring our environment and you can come up with observation. One uh, discovery was the sequencing of the human genome the DNA of human beings by Craig Ventner. <clears throat> what does this do? It leads to important conclusions based on inductive reasoning. What is inductive reasoning? Well, because all living things that we've found so far have been made out of cells, it's a fairly good generalization to say all living things are made out of cells. Now, is this necessarily always gonna be the case? No. What if we go to Mars or a different planet, we find living things not made out of cells? Well, then this, conclusion would no longer be valid. But because we have made all these observations, we can come up with this conclusion. All of these things are made of self. It produces fundamental conclusions in science. So we understand how the world works based on discovery. But hypothesis-driven science is much more important because observations that you see are going to lead to questions. Why, does this, why are these things look like this? Well, why does this happen? Why do things look like this? Why do we have these things occurring? So what it does in, in order to come up with a, an appropriate and scientifically valid theory, is you have to follow the scientific method. And much of the reason why non-scientific uh, explanations don't hold water in the scientific community is because they don't follow the scientific method. So what is the scientific method? Well, it's a series of logical steps and investigations or experiments that lead to an objective conclusion. Now, what are the key words here? Logical rather than emotional. You'd use logic to explain it rather than a desire for some foregone conclusion to be the case. The objective conclusion, you don't expect or need a conclusion to be true at the beginning. You let the results guide you. Now, this is a figure from your text, directly from your text. This is the scientific method, the basics. So we start with making an observation. You notice something that leads to a question. I wonder why that's the case. You form a hypothesis. Now, what is a hypothesis? Now, if I ask you to tell me about this on the test, I'll be asking you to explain what these terms mean. So I'm gonna go through this and then I'm gonna go through an example and then we'll talk about what you may need to do on one of the tests. Now, hypothesis, write this down. Hypothesis is an educated guess based on experience and based on experience and education. Uh, so your hypothesis is you've made some observations, your experience in making the observations and your past knowledge lead to a hypothesis, which is basically an educated guess. You're guessing, but it's based on observations. So what you do then is if you assume that the reason why something happens is based on this hypothesis, then you make a prediction. So if I run a test using this hypothesis, I expect that X will happen. This result, result will happen. So what do you have to do to test it? You do an experiment to test your prediction, which is based on your hypothesis, why you think something is happening. When you do the experiment, you analyze the results. And there's two possible outcomes of a test. So if the hypothesis is supported, you report the results and that reinforces the hypothesis and can lead to a theory. If the hypothesis is not supported, well, you still report the results. The most important thing is you go back to this step, you form a new hypothesis and retest it. The key is you can't just accept the results that work for the hypothesis that you originally formed. If the results don't support the hypothesis, you have to be willing to go back to the beginning. And that's when the key is to real true science. If you don't say, I assume, I know 
that my guess as to why this happens is true. So any results that I see that don't support that must be false. And therefore, I'm going to only accept the results that support my hypothesis. That is not science. If you're not willing to let go of your hypothesis, then you are not doing proper science. So here's another example of this. Now, this is a little bit old school because most people don't use flashlights. Some people still do. Most people use their cell phones. But we're going to go into an example of it here. Okay, so what is the observation that this lady is making? Well, she's observing that her flashlight doesn't work. Now, if I ask, why is it not working? Most people will just automatically assume it's because the battery is dead. Why do they make that assumption? Because they have experience that when things that run on batteries don't work, the reason why it's not working is because of the batteries. And that's a fair assumption, but it's an assumption. It's not knowledge. You're guessing. So what she's doing is when she sees that her flashlight isn't working, she asks the question, why is this not happening? Why is my flashlight not working? And most of us jump right past this to the hypothesis. I think the reason why the flashlight isn't working is because the batteries are dead, which is a fair assumption or a fair hypothesis because we have a lot of experience with that. The next step is her prediction. <clears throat> if I switch out the batteries, then my flashlight will work. So she does the test and that is she switches out the, the batteries. Now, in most cases, the test that she did is gonna cause her flashlight to work and that reinforces the result and reinforces the idea that if something runs on batteries is not working, you replace the batteries. But what if she replaces the batteries and it doesn't work, still doesn't work? Does that mean the new batteries were no good? No, not necessarily. For example, in some older flashlights, there's a thing called the light bulb. I know that's something many of you don't have a lot of experience with, but light bulbs back in the day used to actually burn out. So it could have been the case that the light bulb was burned out. So what you would do in that case is put the original batteries back and put in a new light bulb. Now, why put the original batteries back? Well, in science, we're not just trying to make something work. We're trying to figure out what the issue was at the beginning. What if the batteries were totally fine? You guys know how expensive batteries can be. So instead of throwing away perfectly good batteries, you put the original batteries in, change the light bulb. Now, if it works, it means the issue was not the batteries. It was the light bulb. And you, now you know what the situation was. So this is a good example. If this one ends up on the test, um, what I do want you to know is I'll be asking you to come up with an example that is not having to do with electrical devices. I want you to come up with a new idea, a new idea of how you could test the scientific method. So I want you to start thinking about that. One of the ways you can think about that and find ideas is to go to web pages that have science fair project ideas. Anything that you're curious about why something happens and how you could test it. You cannot use an object that runs on batteries to give your explanation. I want you to come up with something new, a new idea, and think about it. Okay, what's another example of the scientific method? Oh, you make an observation. Two plants in the corner are not growing very well. Why are they not growing very well? Well, the assumption would be not enough light, but you don't know for sure. So the observation can lead to questions. I wonder what I could do to help them grow better. Now, we know that corners often don't have as much light as near windows, but that's not necessarily what's causing them to have a problem. A hypothesis based on the observation and your understanding of plants work is formed. Maybe the sickly plants are not getting enough light. That's my guess as to why they're not growing well. The hypothesis leads to predictions. If I give one of the sickly plants more light, it will grow better. Now, why not move both of them? Well, because we really want to know what the problem was. And if we move both of them and they both get better, we don't know whether it was the light itself or the fact that it might be warmer in the sunlight or the plants are just naturally perking back up. And what do we mean by naturally perking back up? Well, if you look at many trees in this area, especially California, you'll notice that they don't have any leaves. Is that because they're dead? No, it's because the leaves fall off. And later in the spring, the leaves will regrow. And it's not based on something we do. It's due based on time of the year. In the spring, leaves regrow. So the only way to know for certain if what you're doing, the experimenter is doing, is causing the change is to leave one where it is, having everything else being the same, with the only difference being that the other plant gets more light. So the prediction leads to the development of tests. If I live one in the corner and put one in the light, 
I will know if insufficient light is the problem with the plants. In that way, the only difference between the two is light. And the idea is we're not just trying to get the plants to grow better, we're trying to figure out what was the problem in the beginning. And that's different. We're not just trying to fix the plants, we're trying to discover what the issue was at the beginning. The test supports the hypothesis, that is the one that you move into the sunlight grows better. You can say plants need more light than is available in a dark corner in order to grow well. But if the other plant that you moved does not grow better, well, the problem might not have been light. It might have been plant food or how much water you're putting out, too much or too little. The temperature might have been too cold or too warm. So for example, we're just trying to figure out what exactly was the problem using the scientific method and not just how quickly can I make these plants grow better. Okay, if the test does not support the hypothesis, you form a new hypothesis and test that. Okay, theories and science. Science is not about accumulating facts. Well, this is a really old school example, but back in the day, people used to have a telephone book. Now you probably have seen those, but now most uh, telephone numbers come from web pages, but a telephone book is full of facts, but it's not science. The reason why it's not science is because it doesn't explain anything. Facts are necessary, but it is the new theories and tests of those theories that drive scientific discovery. So even a book that shows all the different birds in North America is not a science book because it's just facts. It doesn't explain anything. Scientific greats like Newton, Darwin, Einstein, Madame Curie, great scientists. Why did they become great? They didn't discover many new facts, but what they did is propose theories that explain a broad range of observations. So when people look out and ask, why does this happen? Instead of using, uh, instead of using uh, myth and superstition to explain why stuff happens, you use scientific understanding. Hundreds of years ago, myths and superstitions drove most of why people did it. For example, when the crops didn't do well, what our ancestors would do is they would slaughter a goat and hope that worked because they didn't understand how the natural world worked. When science came in, we understood what was required and they stopped slaughtering goats to get better plants. These theories have stood the test of time. The key is when you develop a theory, other scientists are gonna to try to knock it down. And if it remains on the top of the hill, like the game of King of the Hill, then it becomes a well-established theory. So for example, Newton, Darwin, and Einstein have theories that have stood the test of time. Now, even if some people don't like what they have to say or don't agree with it, it doesn't mean that it's not a good theory. Uh, it only becomes a, a discredited theory as if you come up with a better theory or find that the experiments that they did were fraudulent. And Newton, Darwin, Einstein, and Curie are considered greats because their theories have held up to other scientific uh, efforts to find problems. Theories only become widely accepted if they're supported by scientific evidence. And these all, the work of these scientists have been supported by scientific evidence. And it bothers me when people say it's only a theory, as if it has no validity if it's just a theory. Well, there's a difference between a hypothesis, something that you come up with. Well, I have a hypothesis. The reason why my car isn't starting is because of a dead battery or gas. A strong scientific theory, like evolution, like gravitational force, like special relativity are more like a law than a theory, especially in terms of how scientists view it, because they have been so heavily supported by scientific experiments. Okay, that is it for uh, chapter one. So I'll be seeing you guys uh, in lab, I hope, and use the, the notes that you just filled in to uh, work on your review questions. The review questions are the source of test question. So make sure that you have those ready to go. I hope to see you in lab sometime soon. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.